at forming new companies. Electricity was a recent invention, and Pellet hoped to be among the foremost developers. In 1883, he founded the Toronto Electric Light Company, and later was an owner of the Toronto Electric Railway. He also made money as a land speculator in the Canadian West. Unlike many businessmen of the time, however, Pellet believed in community service. He sponsored many charitable organizations and supported various good causes. In spite of his business dealings, Pellet found time to tour England and Europe regularly. He brought back ideas for a castle on the hill. Pellet's castle, however, would not be a damp, drafty castle of the Middle Ages. It would have the latest technology. Construction of Castle Loma began in 1910 and was completed in 1914. Outwardly, it looked like a medieval castle, but inside, it was comfortable and luxurious. There were 98 rooms, three bowling alleys, 30 bathrooms, 25 fireplaces, and 5,000 electric lights. It had an electric elevator and an indoor swimming pool. There was a library of 100,000 books. A temperature-controlled wine cellar, a shooting gallery, and a large art collection. Pellet ordered only the most expensive materials and employed the best craftsmen. The cost of all of this was 3.5 million dollars—a huge sum in those days. Pellet and his wife liked to entertain. They often opened up Casa Loma for special events. Sometimes he would invite all 1,000 men from the Queen's Own Rifles over for the weekend. The Pellets also held parties for the staff. Pellet had hoped that Casa Loma would be the center of an extensive subdivision. He hoped that wealthy people would build grand homes nearby, and so he bought up the land near his castle. Unfortunately for Pellet, most of the people coming to Toronto were poor immigrants who couldn't afford large houses. Pellet was unable to sell his land holdings, and his income declined. In 1924, Pellet turned Casa Loma over to the City of Toronto because he could not pay his property tax. All the contents of Casa Loma went on auction soon after. His 1.5 million dollar collection of art and artifacts sold for only two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Now Casa Loma is a leading Toronto tourist attraction. The castle in the middle of the city has four hundred thousand visitors each year. It is the closest thing in North America. To a real European castle. Charlie Brown. On October second, nineteen fifty, a new comic strip appeared in American newspapers. The hero of the strip was a round-headed kid named Charlie Brown. In the very first cartoon, two young schoolmates watch Charlie Brown walking by, and one comments, "Well, here comes old Charlie Brown. Yes, sir, good old Charlie Brown. How I hate him." This comic strip was to become one of the most popular in history. Its creator, Charles M. Schultz, drew the strip for 50 years until his death. But reruns of Peanuts still appear regularly in the newspaper. What are some of the characteristics of Charlie Brown and his friends that have made the cartoon popular? Charlie Brown is an unlikely hero. Other kids don't like being around him because the things he does never seem to work out properly. Kids want to be with someone who's good-looking, popular, and successful, so they can feel part of his success. Charlie Brown is always worrying, hardly ever upbeat, afraid of failure, and always making mistakes. His kite gets snagged in the tree. He needs counseling from Lucy. His dog Snoopy is more popular than he is, and the little red-haired girl never notices him. In short, Charlie Brown is a loser. Charlie Brown illustrates all the insecurities that kids have. Many of these anxieties carry over into adult life. Sometimes they reflect problems in the life of the comic strip's creator, Charles M. Schultz. Schultz suffered from depression much of his life and had a difficult time in school. He was not very popular with his classmates. Humor and laughter are often a way of dealing with problems, and in the Peanuts strip, the world can laugh at all the silly things that people do. Because of his honest way of dealing with problems, Charlie Brown and his friends are more interesting than the average comic strip characters. The characters represent adult personality types. Charlie Brown is wishy-washy and is afraid to do things for fear of failure. Lucy is a pushy, overbearing female who thinks she knows it all. Linus, her younger brother, is intellectual but insecure. He still clings to his baby blanket for security. Schroeder is preoccupied with Beethoven's music to the exclusion of everything else. 
Sally, Charlie Brown's younger sister, combines both a romantic attachment to Linus and a desire for material things. Peppermint Patty is a tomboy who loves baseball, but nonetheless has a romantic crush on Charlie Brown. Snoopy, the dog, represents a cool, detached, inventive individual who also relies on basic creature comforts. These characters add up to a human comedy. In the comic strip, we can see ourselves and the people around us making mistakes, getting second chances, but tending to do the same things over again. Behind the humor of Peanuts is a serious message: words can hurt, relationships are important, truth is difficult to find, criticism is too common, greed can easily overpower us. These messages are both timeless and timely. Peanuts has also been turned into television specials and several movies. Snoopy stuffed toys are popular all over the world. A huge industry has grown from a simple comic strip. Perhaps this means that while we all secretly want to be winners, we really identify more closely with the Charlie Browns of this world. Conquering Lake Ontario. In 490 BC, the Greek runner Philippides ran the 24 miles from Marathon to Athens to announce the Athenian victory. His endurance was so much admired that runners ever since have attempted to run similar long marathon distances. In the 20th century, however, long-distance swimming has also attracted attention and admiration. To swim the English Channel or Juan de Fuca Strait between Vancouver Island and the mainland have become challenges for both male and female swimmers. In September 1954, some Canadian businessmen from Toronto offered veteran Californian champion Florence Chadwick ten thousand dollars if she could swim Lake Ontario. They felt sure that such a feat would attract large crowds. Chadwick had swum the English Channel in both directions. However, no one, neither man nor woman, had crossed Lake Ontario. It was a 32-mile swim through cold water and difficult currents. Two other women also decided to take up the challenge. One, Winnie Roach Lausler, had also swum the English Channel. The other was a 16-year-old girl named Marilyn Bell. The swimmers traveled to the mouth of the Niagara River on the south side of Lake Ontario. They would swim from Youngstown in the USA back to Toronto. Bad weather delayed the swim for several days. During the night of September 8th, the weather cleared and the swimmers entered the water before midnight. Guided by her coach's flashlight, Marilyn swam through the dark water and soon passed Chadwick, who was lifted from the water after swimming 12 miles. Lausler made it further, but she too eventually had to give up. Marilyn not only had to overcome her fears of the dark, but she was attacked during the night by blood-sucking lamprey eels. She was able to knock these off with her fist. As dawn approached, the winds and waves increased, and Marilyn's weariness mounted. Her coach, Gus Ryder. Passed her some corn syrup on a stick, and later gave her liniment for her tired legs. He wrote messages on a blackboard to encourage her to keep going. Sometimes he tricked her into thinking that she was nearer to the shore than she was. Marilyn fell asleep in the water twice and had to be awakened. The second time, a friend of hers jumped into the water beside her and swam with her for a distance. Because Marilyn's strength was declining, she was being pushed off course by the currents. Although the direct route was 32 miles, Marilyn swam a total of 45 miles. The last few miles were extremely difficult. Marilyn's family and the lifeguards felt that she should be taken out of the water, but her coach threatened to quit as her coach if the swimmer gave up. It was getting dark again, and the swimmer was barely conscious as she approached the shore. Thousands of people lined the shore, hoping to touch her or get a picture of her. Marilyn's supporters had to push the crowds back so they wouldn't stop her from touching the shore. Finally, after 21 hours in the water, Marilyn reached land. The exhausted girl was rushed to an ambulance. She had lost about 20 pounds of her 120 pounds weight in the crossing. Finally, she was able to sleep. Huge crowds came out to see her the next day, and two days later, there was a parade in her honor through the streets of Toronto. Everyone admired the courage and endurance of the 16-year-old girl who became the first person to swim across Lake Ontario. Career and Ives. Before the widespread use of photography, there was a large market for artistic depictions of scenes and events. A process for making prints called lithography became popular in North America during the early 19th century. 
One young artist who mastered this technique was Nathaniel Currier, 1813 to 1888. Currier opened his own shop in 1834. Currier's success came when he issued prints of newsworthy events. His ruins of the Merchants Exchange followed a great fire in New York, December 1834. One of Currier's prints of a disastrous fire on a steamboat was published in the New York Sun in 1840. There was also a large market for decorative prints. People who couldn't afford oil paintings would buy color prints to put on their walls. Some of these prints were copies of paintings. Sometimes Currier mentioned his source, and sometimes not. In 1852, James Merritt Ives (1824 to 1895) joined Currier's firm. In 1857, he became Currier's partner. After that, the firm was known as Courier and Ives. Altogether, the firm produced about seven thousand different subjects. Small prints sold for about twenty-five cents, and large color prints for about three dollars. Traveling salesmen went from house to house selling them. Courier and Ives sometimes hired the original painters to make the print. More often, someone from their own studio either composed an original subject or copied an existing painting or drawing. Contemporary news remained popular. Courier and Ives' prints included the first appearance of Jenny Lind in America, 1850, the fall of Richmond, Virginia, 1865, and the Great Fire at Chicago, 1871. A common subject was a patriotic scene from American history. Interesting occupations such as whaling, bird hunting, trapping, fur trading, and deep sea fishing were portrayed. Pioneer and Indian topics were in demand. However, the most popular of all scenes were winter and holiday prints of ordinary people enjoying life: farm scenes, buggy rides, sleigh rides, market scenes, blacksmith shops, and town scenes sold well. Favorite prints included American forest scene, maple sugaring, 1860; home to Thanksgiving, 1863; winter in the country, 1862; life in the country, the morning ride, 1859. And American Winter Sports, 1856. These scenes are still popular. Even today, you can buy Christmas cards with Courier and Ives winter scenes. This collection of prints gives a remarkable picture of America between 1934 and 1907. Although the prints are sometimes more romantic than reality, they give a lot of information about everyday life. They depict styles of clothing, trains and boats, buildings and bridges, and popular activities. They also tell us what sorts of scenes people at that time liked, and what their artistic tastes were. Eventually, advances in photography made this kind of printmaking obsolete. In 1906, the firm of Courier and Ives closed its doors. For a while, these prints were not considered very valuable. Nowadays, however, there are many collectors, and Courier and Ives prints once again can be found decorating North American homes. Death Valley, California. The steep mountains of southeastern California dip suddenly into a deep valley. Rain is kept out of the valley by the high mountains which form its western slopes. Although mountains surround the valley, Death Valley itself is very low. In fact, its lowest point is 282 feet below sea level, the lowest point of land in North or South America. Death Valley is about 140 miles long, but only a few miles wide. It got its name in 1849 during the California Gold Rush. Gold seekers attempted to cross Death Valley on the way to California's gold fields, and some died of thirst there. There is hardly any water in the valley. The average rainfall is only a couple of inches a year. It is also one of the hottest places in North America in the summer. Temperatures of 134 Fahrenheit have been recorded. As a result of this heat and dryness, Death Valley is a desert. These conditions give rise to the valley's most important products: mineral salts and salt deposits. One of these products is borax, which has many industrial uses. Borax was removed from the desert using 20 mule teams hitched in a long string. Later, a railway was built to help carry out these minerals. In spite of its desert conditions, Death Valley has considerable animal and plant life. Of course, its animals and plants are those typical in desert conditions. Only on the salt flats do plants refuse to grow. With even a small rainfall in the spring, the desert will come alive with wild flowers. Very few places in the world have such a contrast in heights and depths. The mountains near the valley are among the highest in continental USA, while the valley itself is the lowest elevation. 
Mount Whitney, at 14,495 feet, is less than 100 miles from Death Valley. The climate in the valley from October to May is generally pleasant. Since Death Valley is now a national park, many tourists visit during this season. Now roads and hotels provide comfortable access. Death Valley is located close to the Nevada border. Its desert conditions are common throughout the area of the American West, just east of the coastal mountains. In most cases, heavy rain falls along the coast, but very little in the interior. Because there is no farming and water is hard to obtain, Death Valley and similar desert areas have very few permanent residents. Dr. Norman Bethune. Some people find their vocation early in life. Others do not discover their life's work until they are older. Norman Bethune tried many things before he fully recognized his true work. Bethune was born in Gravenhurst, Ontario, in 1890. He was the son of a Presbyterian clergyman. The family moved frequently, and many of the places they lived were close to lakes, rivers, and woods. As a young man, Norman loved the outdoors. He became a good swimmer and skater. He also showed that he had a strong, independent streak. He hated rules, but also had a strong sense of justice. The young man studied science at the University of Toronto from 1909 to 1911. After that, he worked for Frontier College. This was a volunteer organization where instructors did the same jobs as local workers during the day and taught them English in the evening. He then returned to Toronto to study medicine. Early in World War I, he joined the Army Medical Corps. He reached France in February 1915, but was wounded in April and eventually returned to Canada. He went back to the war in 1917. At the end of the war, he continued to study medicine in London, England. While he was in England, he married a Scottish woman, Frances Campbell Penny. Although Bethune loved her very much, their marriage ended in divorce in 1927. The couple moved to Detroit, Michigan in 1924, where Bethune opened a medical practice. In the middle of his growing success, he contracted tuberculosis. This was a low point in Bethune's life. Thinking that he was going to die, he considered suicide. One day, however, he read of a new treatment for tuberculosis and insisted that his doctors perform the operation on him. As a result, Bethune recovered. The year was 1927. For some years after, Bethune devoted himself to the treatment of tuberculosis patients. However, he began to notice a pattern. Rich patients who could afford proper medical care usually recovered. Poor patients usually died. Bethune became a supporter of government funded medical care. Bethune admired the government funded health system in communist Russia. He was angry when Canada would not support his idea about Medicare. Bethune wanted to change the world, and communism seemed like the most promising method. In 1936, Bethune went to Spain to help the Republicans fight the fascists. He was appalled to see the fascists' allies, Germany and Italy, dropping bombs on women and children. He developed a hatred for fascism. He also decided that doctors should go to the front rather than wait for the wounded to be brought to them. In Spain, he developed a blood transfusion service, which saved many lives. Returning to North America, Bethune heard about the Japanese attack on China in 1937. Early in 1938, he sailed for China. Bethune had joined the Communist Party. Now he went to join the army of Mo Se Tung in northern China. Mo's army was suffering badly from Japanese attacks. They had hardly any doctors or medical supplies. Difficulties only made Bethune work harder. He soon organized a hospital, trained medical workers, and wrote textbooks. He insisted on operating right at the front to give the wounded a better chance of survival. He went for days without sleep and gave his own blood to help the wounded. In November 1939, he died from blood poisoning, but his work lived on. In 1973, the Canadian government bought his house that he was born in and turned it into a museum. Ebenezer Scrooge. In the story A Christmas Carol, Scrooge is an English businessman who thinks about nothing but money. He has no friends and spends no time with his family. He lives alone, eats alone, and works alone, except for his underpaid clerk, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge never spends his money, but hoards it all and prides himself on his frugality. Scrooge hates Christmas. It's all nonsense to him. 
People spend money on food and gifts and parties. Often they can't afford what they spend. Worse than that, they take a whole day off work and so lose a chance to make more money. Scrooge is angry that he has to give his clerk the day off with pay. He feels that he's being robbed. Christmas is also a time when people are asked to give money to help the poor. Scrooge is angry when two men come to his door asking for donations. Scrooge argues that he pays taxes, which support prisons and workhouses. It is not his business to worry about the problems of other people. Scrooge represents businessmen who see the bottom line as all that matters. Scrooge's partner Marley had died seven years earlier. He was like Scrooge in all respects. That evening, which is Christmas Eve, Scrooge is visited by Marley's ghost. Marley drags steel chains round about him, which contain keys, cash boxes, ledgers, purses, and deeds. These are the things that Marley cared about when he was alive. Marley is condemned in death to wander the world and tells Scrooge that the same fate is likely to happen to him. However, three spirits will visit Scrooge, and if Scrooge listens to them, he may escape this fate. The first spirit comes and takes Scrooge back to the early scenes of his own life. He sees himself being left behind at school while the other boys went home for the holidays. Then his little sister arrives to tell him he could go home too. Another scene was of a cheerful Christmas party when Scrooge was a young man. A third scene showed him with the girl he was planning to marry. She left him because he no longer cared about anything but money. The second spirit shows Scrooge what people are doing that very Christmas. He shows Scrooge the preparations that people, even poor people, are making to celebrate Christmas. They visit Bob Cratchit's tiny home. There they see the family cooking their little Christmas dinner. Bob's son, Tiny Tim, has been weakened by disease and has to use a crutch to walk. The family is delighted with its meal, small as it is. They see other scenes of poor people, miners and sailors, celebrating Christmas. Finally, they visit Scrooge's nephew and view his Christmas party and its games. The third spirit was the spirit of Christmas yet to come, the future. This spirit does not talk, but points to scenes connected with Scrooge. They overhear some businessmen joking about someone who has recently died. Scrooge sees that he no longer occupies his usual place of business. The spirit then shows him two women who have stolen the bedclothes, curtains, and clothes off the dead man and taken them to a pawnbroker. The spirit takes Scrooge to the room where the dead man died. The only people who are happy about the death are a young couple who owed him money. The spirit then shows Scrooge the Cratchit's house, where they're mourning the death of Tiny Tim. Finally, the spirit takes him to a churchyard where they stand among the graves. Then the spirit points to the name of the dead man on the tombstone. Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge is going to die, and no one will care. Scrooge finds himself in his own bed on Christmas morning. He is resolved now to avoid the fate that the spirits had shown him. He is delighted that he's getting a second chance. Scrooge decides to surprise all his acquaintances, and he begins by buying a huge goose and sending it to the Cratchits. On his walk, he meets the two men collecting for the poor and offers them a large sum of money. He goes on to join his nephew at a Christmas party. The next day, when Bob Cratchit comes into work, Scrooge gives him a raise in his salary. He also takes care of Tiny Tim so that Tim recovers his health. Charles Dickens' story was written at a time when governments did very little to help the poor. Wages were very low, and many businessmen were unwilling to look after their workers properly. Dickens points out that people like Scrooge not only make other people unhappy, but also are usually unhappy themselves. It is possible to be a very rich businessman and a poor human being at the same time. Video designed by English Seven Levels dot com. Etiquette. Etiquette is a French word. The original meaning was little tickets. These tickets were given to people who were attending a public ceremony. Printed on the ticket were instructions about how to behave on this occasion. So etiquette came to mean the way to behave on public occasions. Etiquette today includes how to introduce people, how to eat properly, how to dress for different occasions, how to speak to different people, and what to do on special occasions. Almost every part of social life can have its particular etiquette. Sometimes etiquette changes or seems to change. There was much behavior attached to courtship, such as a man holding the door open for a woman. Nowadays, some people find this outdated, but politeness is always a good idea. It is nice to hold the door open for the next person, whoever they are. 
In fact, it sometimes seems like contemporary life encourages bad manners. Etiquette is no longer taught to young people. Moreover, in a youth culture, young people take their examples from other young people. As a result, good manners aren't considered important. The point of etiquette is to help people to get along with each other. If people behave in an accepted manner, there is less chance of misunderstanding. It is important for people to think about treating other people well. If everyone does what they feel like doing, it doesn't seem like they respect other people. Etiquette can help things to go a lot smoother. Manners vary from culture to culture, but the intention is the same: to treat people with consideration. This is a way to reduce conflict. Sometimes we can understand where these customs come from. Originally, shaking hands with your right hand probably meant that you weren't carrying a weapon. Taking off your hat may originally have been taking off your helmet. This meant that you weren't going to fight. Nowadays, there are new areas of social life. For example, a lot of conversation now takes place on the telephone. Perhaps because there is no traditional telephone etiquette, some people feel free to be rude. Try to treat the person on the phone just the way you would treat them if you were actually talking to them. Most people feel it is rude to interrupt a conversation, but many people seem to think that it is okay to interrupt someone talking on the phone. Children especially need to be taught not to interrupt. The internet also needs its own etiquette or netiquette, because you cannot see whom you are talking to, and they may be thousands of miles away. It is easy to misunderstand. Also, people cannot hear the tone of your voice over the internet. For this reason, some people use smileys, little faces, to show how they are feeling. If they make a joke, they can use a smiling face or print grin after their remark. This tips off the recipient that their remark is not to be taken seriously. Using simple words like "please" and "thank you" can make everyday life a lot smoother and happier. Like a lot of other things, we do not realize the importance of etiquette until it starts to disappear. Gambling. Many governments have turned to legalized gambling as a way to increase revenues. Raising taxes has become very unpopular, and gambling can be seen as a cash cow. Large casinos are often considered good for areas with high unemployment. Most new casinos include a variety of slot machines, table games such as blackjack and roulette wheels. Opponents of gambling point to problems associated with it. Crime rates go up, especially with respect to theft and prostitution. People become addicted to gambling and play until they are broke. Stress is put on families when one member gambles and the grocery and rent money are spent. On the other hand, many people view gambling as an exciting form of entertainment. They look forward to the opportunity to play the lottery or go to the casino. Often, they feel that they are getting good value in terms of entertainment for what they spend. The truth is probably that some people can control the urge to gamble, while some cannot. People who find gambling really exciting feel that they have to go back for that high, even if it means spending all their money. Many people doubt that governments should promote gambling, since it is certain to produce addicts. There has also been some question whether gambling is good for the local economy. If a casino is built in an area of high unemployment, will local people really benefit? The answer seems to be both yes and no. People may benefit if the gamblers come in large numbers from outside the area and spend their money there. That is, if the casino is a notable tourist attraction. On the other hand, if not many people come from outside the area, there are few benefits. In this case, most of the gamblers are local people who are spending the little money they have. Gambling is especially attractive to older and retired people, since older people don't have much chance of making a lot of new money. The thought of winning the jackpot is very attractive to them. Casinos regularly run buses from retirement homes so that seniors can come and gamble. Some would see this as taking advantage of lonely people. There are stories in the newspaper about couples leaving their children locked in the car for six or eight hours while they gamble. One man hoped to improve his finances by gambling, but he lost heavily. His wife found out and went gambling herself, hoping to win some of the money back. Before long, they had to sell their house to pay their gambling debts. Gambling has usually been associated with organized crime. Even today, when government agencies supervise gambling, it would appear that there is still a crime connection. This may be because many of the best gamblers and gamblers.